Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Tom Talk Stuff. I'm Glee Man Tom, and today we've got another anime to cover. So let's check out an iconic series nearly as old as Dragon Ball itself. Well, the manga, anyways. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. By the way, this video absolutely will contain spoilers. So if you haven't seen Phantom Blood yet, don't worry. You'll have plenty of time to back out before you hear anything you shouldn't. Take your time, jump over to Hulu or Crunchyroll, and give this series a once-over. But you know when you're done? Why don't you come on back, because I could really use the views. Anyways, you know how sometimes you try to watch a show or a movie that you know should be to your liking, but for whatever reason you just can't get into it? Well, that happened to me about a year ago, when I tried to watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and I just couldn't seem to do it. I was barely even able to finish the first episode. But now, some time has passed, and I was thinking about giving it another go. So, I put a poll up on Google+, asking if I should try it again. And after getting nearly 170 votes of assent, saying I should give it another shot, I couldn't refuse. And, well, I liked it. Again, I didn't enjoy episode one but I wasn't wanting to shut it off halfway through in disgust like last time either. Huh, it's kind of funny. It makes me wonder, what was different between now and then? Was my mood different? Did I enjoy it more now because I was doing it on the request of someone else and had to kind of push through the parts I didn't like? Or, back at the time, was I simply looking for an excuse to turn it off so I could do something else? To be honest, I might never know, but I am thankful I decided to give JoJo another go, because I did end up enjoying myself. The plot and setting of Phantom Blood is an oldie, but a goodie. It's the classic tale of good versus evil, of man versus the monster, a tale of rivalry, jealousy, and of loss. Basically, there's the good guy, our protagonist, Jonathan Joestar, the JoJo of the series. Oh, I say that because apparently with every new season, a new descendant takes the lead as main character. It's kind of an interesting plot point. The other main character of this series is our antagonist, his foster brother, the dastardly Dio Brando. Originally, the devious orphan, Dio Brando, intended to impl simply infiltrate the Joestar family and take family fortune for his own. He tried to make Jojo look like an idiot for a while. He was poisoning Jojo's father and all the while acting nice. He was horrible, just awful. And upon being found out by Jojo, Dio plots his murder as well. You see, at the time, Jojo is an archaeologist major and is studying this weird old stone mask. And then when the mask comes in contact with blood, it sprouts out these weird spikes. So Dio, also knowing about the mask, plots to kill Jonathan with it, to make it appear like his own research did him in, you know? However, upon hearing the ancient mask can transform a person into a vampire, Dio plots went from simply taking over the Joestar's family wealth to, well, taking over the world. Upon becoming a vampire, Dio begins gathering a horde of evil around himself, preparing for his initial conquest. But, standing in his way, his oldest rival, Jonathan Joestar, who goes on a, well, very video game RPG-like journey in order to gather the skills and allies needed to defeat his foe. Well, that's basically the plot in a nutshell. Time to move on to the characters. First off, Jonathan Joestar. I think it's obvious to begin with the main character, but honestly, there's not a whole bunch to say. Jonathan's a gentleman, yes, but also a badass. Noble and strong, tough but fair, and an extremely skilled and powerful fighter. But he's also quite standard for this kind of story. He's a goody-goody, but he was designed that way. The author wanted Jonathan to be a symbol of purity and dignity. Not that I mind. I kind of like the whole noble, spirited knight who faces off against the dreaded monster trope. Speaking of the dreaded monster, though, Dio Brando is the next character we'll discuss. He is the ultimate evil of the Phantom Blood arc. He's scary strong and extremely egocentric, and he was downright nasty in that first episode. 
till learning he had to at least play the part of nice guy. Then, later, when he became a vampire, something happened I thought impossible. He got even more fond of himself, thinking himself some sort of god. He raised an army to do his beck and call, and even somehow created these mixed beings. At one point, he had a dog with a man's head and a bird with a cat head. It was all very strange. However, I must admit, while he was a truly nasty villain, at least he became more interesting after becoming a monster. In the end, the only thing I really liked about Dio was that he had a weird sort of respect for Jojo. All right, moving on. The next character is Robert E.O. Speedwagon. Ah, oh, yes. Here comes probably my favorite character of the arc, as well as the first proper classic rock reference, which is something I love about the series. I mean, come on. R.E.O. Speedwagon? What I loved so much about Speedwagon's character is, well, he was us, the viewer. At least that's my opinion. I mean, yeah, he did have a few helpful moments in the beginning, when he was this scarred, street tough, with a hat made out of blades. And yes, he was the one who smashed the mask. Good for him, by the way. But the poor guy didn't really have much to contribute. While all the other main characters in the series were starting to show off superhuman powers, Speedwagon could only support and cheer, yell his head off for his friends, assist in aiding the injured, and boo his enemies. But in this arc, at least, he didn't have a whole lot to do. But that's fine. I just like him. And the guy at least kept himself from becoming a burden. Ooh, and I hear we'll be able to see him again in the next arc, which makes me really happy. So, moving on. Ah, Zeppeli. Will A. Zeppeli, or also known as Baron Zeppeli. Honestly, I don't want to talk about him much. It's still too fresh, you know? Oh, Zeppeli was a fun, quirky character. His role in the series was as Jojo's teacher in the mystical forest of Hammon. He was a genuinely amusing as well as really impressive character. This guy was a true hero. He has been spending years looking for and preparing to destroy the stone mask. The mask discovered originally by his father's archaeology team. The same mask that took his father and turned him into a monster, killing everyone in that bat past but Zeppeli, and the same mask that turned Dio into the monster he is today. Upon learning of the strange power known as Hammon, Zeppeli travels to India to a temple in order to learn from Master Tom Petty. Get it? Tom Petty? Uh, anyways, he has known for years that his pursuit of the stone mask was a result in his death. And when the time came, the man barely hesitated. He charged ahead to Jojo's aid, and when it was all done, he gave Jojo his life. Literally. He used this technique that passes life force over to Jojo, which appeared to make Jonathan much, much stronger. While the dude passed away with no regrets, it doesn't mean we don't regret. I mean, come on, he was a great character, and I didn't want him to go, damn it. <sighs> well, that's it for the characters. There's a few more, but I don't really have much to say about them. We had Arena and Paco, but they can be summed up rather quickly, you know? Arena's Jojo's lady love, and Paco's, well, a boy caught up in Jojo and Dio's mess. They're scared, but they press on. See? Done. Not much to say. All right. Next up, the animation and sound for the series. The animation for the series is the only thing so far I could really call bizarre. The story has really been kind of shown in standard up to now. Now, let me be clear, the animation done by Studio, Studio David in the show was really good. No one's doubting that. But the series also likes to invert the colors every now and then. So suddenly characters that should have blue hair, have red hair, or green hair. The whole color scheme gets twisted, and honestly, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it yet. Plus, I don't know if it's simply the way they drew their side characters, or if it was the period outfits they were wearing, but I had a difficulty seeing them as children. Jojo and Dio did not look like pre- to mid-teens in that first episode. They looked more to be in their early 20s. And when those bullies stole Arena's doll, same thing. I just couldn't help but think, why does this full-grown woman need a doll? And why are these obvious 30-year-olds leching over a doll? I mean, they have some serious problems. 
Okay, I might have just rambled on a minute for there, but, you know, on to the opening and ending pieces. I know I brought up video game RPG stuff through this review so far, and the main reason for that is the opening piece of the show. Personally, I'm not a fan of CGI in anime, and when I watch the opening song, that's all I can see. It honestly looks like the title screen of an old PlayStation game. So the whole video game thing kind of got stuck in my head. I liked the ending piece a hell of a lot more. I liked the visuals. I liked the music. I don't think I ever actually skipped it to go on to the next episode. I just think I let it play through. It had that real classic rock vibe, you know? And I really loved it. Well, I think we're about there. Overall, I quite enjoyed myself. I give it a, oh, 7 out of 10. It's a pretty good show, but not great. I'm really expecting a lot more out of this next arc. I really am. However, I did enjoy Jonathan's journey. Not his end so much, but, you know. I'm wondering if the baby he had Aaron to take will have a future in the series. Will it be the continuing of the Joestar line? Did Jonathan even have enough time with his new wife to, you know, create an heir? I guess we'll find out in the next episode, but it's killing me because I had to stop watching long enough to try to write this review and then record and then post and I've had all these mic problems and oh I'm telling you all you have no idea how much I sacrifice for you I'm just kidding I'm just not super patient I'm really not I think my favorite part of the show what really hooked me in was Hammond I love those supernatural powers based on life and will Nen from Hunter Hunter Hockey from One Piece. Oh, let's see if I can get this right. I keep messing it up on the recording. Fear from Nirari Hyun. Oh my god, I did it in a single take. But as much as I liked Hammond, I also felt gypped by how rushed the explanation and training was. Honestly, I barely understand what Hammond is. Maybe it's because training arcs are some of my all-time favorites when it comes to anime and manga. I just felt like it wasn't done well enough. I can give you an explanation of Nen. I can tell you how hockey works, or how a yokai would harness their fear. But Hammon? Apparently it's in your blood and comes out with proper breathing. That's it. That's all I know. Yellow overdrive? Scarlet overdrive? Turquoise overdrive? Metal overdrive? What do any of these even mean? How does one activate, activate the yellow sun overdrive instead of the scarlet? Do they just make it up as they go along? kind of wondering if you have to read the manga to get a better hang of it. Or if I'll get a better explanation in the next arc. Oh, I hope so. But even with all those complaints in mind, I still enjoyed it. Hammond's cool, whether I properly understood it or not. Well, if you made it to the end of this video, thanks a bunch. You get a gold star. You can find it either in the like button, which is that little thumbs up icon below the video, or in the subscribe button. Fun fact, click both and you get a platinum star. Hurry now while supplies last. Well, I'm Gleam and Tom, and you can also find me on Google+, Pinterest, and Tumblr. Take care. Peace. I'm out.